Thank you very much for joining our study. This is a personal understanding uh, of the Baha'i Writings. It is only my view on it. For an official view, turn to the Baha'i Scriptures themselves, please, and visit baha'i.org. Um, I wish to thank the uh, Baha'i World Administration, uh, all those that are serving their communities out there. And please note that there is an audio file, uh, so you can listen to this presentation instead of viewing it. And also, any quotes that are used will be in a PDF in the description. So today's topic is a relationship uh, between the Baha'i Faith and Hinduism. Uh, one of the fundamental teachings of the Baha'i Faith is the unity of religion. Um, to many people this is a self-evident uh, concept, whilst to others it appears quite shocking, because it seems as if the world religions are very diverse in what they say about the nature of ultimate reality, or the nature of the founders of those faiths, or different concepts about the life beyond this one. In a document called One Common Faith from the Baha'i World Center, uh, we read the following quote. The objection most commonly raised against the foregoing conception of religion is the assertion that the differences among the revealed faiths are so fundamental that to present them as stages or aspects of one unified system of truth does violence to the facts. So we're here being told that um, to present the different religions of our world as one unified system uh, does violence to the facts, meaning it just seems to go against what these faiths themselves actually say. Uh, the Baha'i World Center then continues, Given the confusion surrounding the nature of religion, the reaction is understandable. So when someone actually responds to the claim of the unity of religion, as being just against the very fabric of what these religions seem to say, uh, this should be understandable to Baha'is. And then it tells us how we should respond. Chiefly, however, such an objection offers Baha'is an invitation to set the principles reviewed here more explicitly in the evolutionary context provided in Baha'u'llah's writings. So when we meet with someone, and we proclaim the idea of the unity of religion, and their reaction is one of shock or disbelief, this is to be understandable and to be seen as an invitation to set these differences in the proper context and try to understand the underlying unity, and I would add by returning to the actual original text themselves. Uh, so what is the problem in this case? When it comes to Hinduism and the Baha'i Faith, um, there seem to be many issues, or for example between Hinduism and Islam. Uh, one, for example, many people believe Hinduism to be polytheistic, meaning it has many gods. Uh, in this context, the problem we're looking at is what is often called uh, the Atman-Brahman equation. It is a belief derived from the texts of Hinduism, particularly a series or collection of texts called the Upanishads, um, very prominent within Hindu thought and Hindu scripture, which actually seem to portray uh, Atman, or our soul, our true self, as equal, as in an equal sign, identical with Brahman, that ultimate reality. Um, having read the Upanishads many times, I can understand really how this comes about. It seems as if we're looking at a text that is telling us that really we are simply a drop in an enormous ocean. We really are identical with that ultimate divine reality. Um, and what we want to do is to try and see, at least with one text, how this can come out of the Upanishads themselves. Of course, the many texts could be used uh, to examine this more in depth, and maybe we'll do that in the future. For now, let's read one text. So this text itself is from the Kata Upanishad. The knowing self is not born. It does not die. It has not sprung from anything. Nothing has sprung from it. Birthless, eternal, everlasting, and ancient, it is not killed when the body is killed. If the killer thinks he kills and the killed man thinks he is slain, neither of these apprehends a right. The self kills not, nor is it killed. Atman, or that divine reality within us, 
Smaller than the small, greater than the great, is hidden in the hearts of all living creatures. A man who is free from desires beholds the majesty of the self through tranquility of the senses and the mind, and becomes free from grief. Though sitting still, it travels far. Though lying down, it goes everywhere. Who but myself can know that luminous Atman, who rejoices and rejoices not? The wise man, having realized Atman, as dwelling within impermanent bodies, but itself bodiless, vast and all, pervading, does not grieve. This Atman cannot be attained by the study of the Vedas, or by intelligence, or by much hearing of sacred books. It is attained by him alone whom it chooses. To such a one, Atman reveals its own form. So there is this reality uh, that is birthless, eternal, ancient, and everlasting. Um, that when the self is, when the person is killed, it is not killed. Um, it is hidden in the hearts of all living creatures, it says, and it is our goal in human existence to actually perceive that underlying unity of reality so that we can rejoice in the beauty of it. This cannot, it's stated, uh, be attained by the study of the Vedas, which are some of the most ancient sacred scriptures of Hinduism, or by intelligence or by much hearing of books. Um, it is attained by him alone whom it chooses. So there is this divine reality on the surface that is uh, equal between ourselves and the fullness of reality, the fullness of ultimate reality. The challenge we have here is that in many of the Western faiths, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, uh, and perceived as, as well within the Baha'i faith, that there is mankind uh, and the soul of humanity, and then there is the Creator, or the ultimate reality out there that these are radically separate categories of being completely different, and that, in a sense, we are talking unbelievably about two different things. Whereas the Upanishads in Vedantic philosophy seem to present it as if, no, that's actually part of the, the illusion that humanity has to get over, that there is this other, this separate, this distinct entity, but rather to see in my Atman, my own soul, the reality of Brahman, the ultimate reality of Hinduism. Um, so this would be one of those cases where on the surface it seems, well, how could we possibly unite uh, these two different communities, or these two different streams of faiths, into an understanding where this is actually a truth revealed and understandable by a different dispensation meaning Judaism, or Christianity, or Islam. We have to see in this uh, distinction uh, an invitation to then begin to truly look to the scriptures of uh, Hinduism themselves, uh, as well as the Baha'i scriptures, to actually bring them together and see if we can bridge these two belief systems. So to begin to understand this concept, um, I want to read something from Shoghi Effendi, the guardian of the Baha'i faith. He says, it is this condition, so sadly morbid, into which society has fallen, that religion seeks to improve and transform. For the core of religious faith is that mystic feeling which unites man with God. This state of spiritual communion can be brought about and maintained by means of meditation and prayer. And this is the reason why Baha'u'llah has so much stressed the importance of worship. It is not sufficient for a believer merely to accept and observe the teachings. He should, in addition, cultivate the sense of spirituality, which he can acquire chiefly by means of prayer. The Baha'i faith, like all other divine religions, is thus fundamentally mystic in character. It is the soul of man which has first to be fed, and this spiritual nourishment prayer can best provide. So the Guardian is telling us that the core of religious faith is actually a mystical communion, uh, that mystic feeling which unites uh, God and man. That 
worship itself is stressed so intensely because it's not merely an acceptance of a series of ideas or merely some practices, but a transformation of human nature itself, an elevation of human existence through meditation and prayer. What I really wanted to highlight here is, is that it in itself is actually saying what the Upanishads just said. That it's not merely through the reading of the Vedas, or hearing of sacred books, or attainment by the mind. Um, what Baha'u'llah teaches in this case, and Shoghi Effendi is sharing with us, is that it is actually this unity, this uniting of man with God through the process of prayer, through the process of worship and meditation, um, that is actually the chief instrument, the core of any divine religion. Um, so we'll move on to uh, actually look at a couple more texts uh, from the Upanishads. Uh, some of these actually seem at first to be teaching this challenging concept of the, the oneness of God and man, um, but also, uh, if you will, adjust it actually as the text goes on. So we're going to start first with the Kata Upanishad. There is one supreme ruler, the inmost self of all beings, who makes his one form manifold. Eternal happiness belongs to the wise, who perceive him within themselves, not to others. It's interesting because at first it's we're told that there's actually one supreme ruler, but that one supreme ruler is actually the inmost self of all beings. This sounds like our Atman equals Brahman. Um, yet at the same time, there's one supreme ruler, and but we must perceive him within ourselves. The quote continues, There is one who is the eternal reality among non-eternal objects, the one truly conscious entity among conscious objects, and who, though non-dual, fulfills the desires of many. Eternal peace belongs to the wise, who perceive him within themselves, not to others. So, Eternal peace can only come to an individual who actually sees this one eternal reality within themselves, not to others, those who fail to actually perceive this concept. It continues, The sages realize that indescribable supreme joy as this is that. How can I realize it? Is it self-luminous? Does it shine brightly or not? The sun does not shine there, nor the moon and the stars, nor these lightnings, not to speak of this earthly fire. He shining, everything shines after him. By his light, all this is lighted. So, in the end of this, it's saying that the sages realize that this supreme joy, capital S, capital J, right, this supreme reality, they realize that this is that. Once again, that Atman equals Brahman, that the nature of myself is that being. And then it asks, well, how does this being, the ultimate reality, Brahman, shine? And it says, he shining, everything shines after him. By his light, all this is lighted. So the nature of the light in, say for my, myself, is actually secondary to the light of Brahman. That his lighting comes first, mine is a reflection of that light. For by his light, all this is lighted. Another quote from the Isa Upanishad, another one of the chief Upanishads. The wise man beholds all beings in the self and the Self in all beings. For that reason he does not hate anyone. To the seer all things have verily become the Self. What delusion, what sorrow can there be for him who beholds that oneness? It is he who pervades all, he who is bright and bodiless, without scar or sinews, pure and by evil unpierced, who is the seer, omniscient, transcendent, and uncreated. He has duly allotted 
to the eternal world, creators their respective duties. So once again, the wise man is beholding all beings in the self, all created things within that entity, and the self in all beings. And that all things have verily become the self, and when someone actually comes to realize this, uh, what sorrow or delusion can there be? Next, from the Mundaka Upanishad. He, the knower of the self, knows that supreme abode of Brahman, which shines brightly and in which the universe rests. Those wise men who, free from desires, worship such a person, transcend the seed of birth. So, the knower of the self, one who actually comes to know the self, knows the supreme abode of Brahman, the ultimate reality in Hinduism, and that all of the universe rests upon this being, Brahman, and that we actually have to be free from desire and worship that being so that we can transcend the seed of birth, to get out of the cycle of birth and rebirth in Hinduism. The quote continues, He who cherishing objects desires them, is born again here or there through his desires. But for him whose desires are satisfied, and who is established in the self, all desires vanish, even here on earth. This Atman cannot be attained through study of the Vedas, nor through intelligence, nor through much learning. He who chooses Atman by him alone is Atman attained. It is Atman that reveals to the seeker its true nature. Once again we have this, this principle that we can't achieve this state of being, wherever it is, through the study of the Vedas, through much learning. Um, and yet we still have in one of the texts previously that the light that we see in ourselves comes from Brahman, that it is a reflection of Brahman. He shines first, we second. And we're being told that we cannot actually achieve it through these means. But again, at the very beginning, the Guardian states this explicitly. The chief means, or the chief instrument, for us to be able to have this state of oneness, this uniting between God and man, a spiritual communion, is through meditation and prayer not from study and not from learning. The quote continues, This Atman cannot be attained by one who is without strength, or earnestness, or is without knowledge, accompanied by renunciation. But if a wise man strives by means of these aids, his soul enters the abode of Brahman. Having realized Atman, the seers become satisfied with that knowledge. Their souls are established in the Supreme Self. They are free from passions, and they are tranquil in mind. Such calm souls, ever devoted to the Self, behold everywhere the omnipresent Brahman, and in the end enter into it, which is all this. So having realized the Atman, that, that reflection of the light of the second shining of Brahman within ourselves, we become established somehow within that ultimate reality, and this is how we become free from passions and tranquil of mind. And that such calm souls who reach, reach this point are ever devoted to the Self, that ultimate Self and perceive Brahman everywhere. This is another quote from the Mudaka Upanishad, and is actually like a uh, quintessential Hindu quote in its imagery, um, and it reads as, as follows. As flowing rivers disappear in the sea, losing their names and forms, so a wise man, freed from name and form, attains the Purusha, who is greater than the great. 
He who knows the supreme Brahman verily becomes Brahman. In his family, no one is born ignorant of Brahman. He overcomes grief, he overcomes evil, free from the fetters of the heart, he becomes immortal. So, as rivers flowing to a sea, we actually become united. Freed from name and form, it says we attain the Purusha, who is that personification of Brahman, at the pinnacle of creation, who is greater than the great. And it says, he who knows the supreme Brahman verily becomes Brahman. Once again, a quintessential Atman-Brahman problem. It sounds here, this river flows to the sea and actually becomes part of the sea, just as this, he who comes to know the supreme Brahman actually becomes that entity. This being actually was a part of this larger entity and is actually returning home. Just as the rivers or the cycle of water are returning back to the sea, so too we are returning back to our actual true state in the Supreme Brahman. Um, each of the following quotes is from Baha'u'llah. He in truth hath throughout eternity been one in his essence, one in his attributes, one in his works. Any and every comparison is applicable only to his creatures, and all conceptions of association are conceptions that belong solely to those that serve him. Any comparison that we make to the Supreme Reality is applicable only to his creatures. This is a theme um, that pops up a great deal in my experience of the Baha'i writings. Uh, both within Baha'u'llah's writings, within the writings of the Bab, and also within the talks of Abdu'l-Bah. That any comparison or attribute we attempt to actually attribute to God is itself a, a, a fashioning of an idea within our own mind. And that they will invariably <laughs> fall short of the actual Divine Reality. Um, there's a quote uh, from Abdu'l-Bah, where he says that when we say that God is all-knowing, uh, we're not claiming that the meaning of what we have for the term all-knowing actually is an attribute of God. We're only denying that he is ignorant. Why? Because our limited language cannot reach to the heights of such an exalted being, we're simply trying to say, like, all-knowing, <laughs> to try and stress as much as we can what that actually might mean. It is as if a, a, an animal, no matter how much it attempted to actually describe a human being, itself could only describe a really intelligent dog, because an, a dog could not possibly understand the heights of knowledge that a human being could have. But what else could such an animal do? but to stretch its language to try and express how exalted humans are, in comparison to themselves. This, um, this concept uh, uh, in theology is called uh, apophatic theology, meaning we are not stating that our praises or our descriptions of God are themselves the true nature of God, but rather we're actually just saying, not ignorant, not weak, not powerless, not hateful. So we use our positive things like all-knowing or all-loving or all-powerful simply to deny that there are any imperfections in the Godhead. Um, this idea of apophatic theology, or theology by negation, negating imperfections, now, we find within Hinduism, we find within Christianity, we find within Islam, every tradition I know of uh, can, within its own academic, scholarly, and mystical circles, uh, give expression to this idea of the limits of human language and the ultimate height of God, and why this prevents us from actually able, being able to truly describe them. Again, from Baha'u'llah, through the teachings of this day star of truth, every man will advance and develop 
until he attaineth a station at which he can manifest all the potential forces with which his inmost true self hath been endowed. It is for this very purpose that in every age and dispensation the prophets of God and his chosen ones have appeared amongst men, and have evinced such power as is born of God, and such might as only the Eternal can reveal. So what is the very purpose for the coming of the prophets of God and their chosen ones? That humans, through their teachings, can manifest all the potential forces with, when, with which our inmost selves have been endowed. And that is the function and purpose of the manifestations of God. Buddha, Jesus, Krishna, the Bab, Baha'u'llah, they come for the very purpose of pulling out of the minds of our inmost selves those delectable gems, those beautiful fruits of the human condition. This is their purpose. We continue. Every time I attempt to make mention of thee, I am hindered by the sublimity of thy station and the overpowering greatness of thy might. For were I to praise thee throughout the length of thy dominion and the duration of thy sovereignty, I would find that my praise of thee can be fit only such as are like unto me, who are themselves thy creatures, and who have been generated through the power of thy decree, and been fashioned through the potency of thy will. And at whatever time my pen ascribeth glory to any one of thy names, methinks I can hear the voice of its lamentation in its remoteness from thee. Baha'u'llah in Prayers and Meditations is saying here that the praise that we would praise God with, quote, can be fit only such as are like unto me, who are themselves thy creatures. And he gives the example of even the words themselves, when we describe him as the all-loving, the all-knowing, the most glorious, he's, he says the words themselves actually lament, because they are so unequal to the glory or knowledge or beauty of the divine being. He's expressing how the essence of what God is not only cannot be praised, extolled, or described, but is actually even above and beyond even attributes themselves. Baha'u'llah is telling us that the very essence of God, the unmanifest, known as Hahut, um, itself is beyond any description, any predicates, any attributes. It's not just that it can't be worshipped in equalness to itself, it is actually beyond the very notion of predication. Should my bodily tongue ever attempt to describe thee as the one whose strength hath ever excelled the strength of the most mighty amongst men, the tongue of my heart would address me, saying, These are but words which can only be adequate to such things as are of the same likeness and nature as themselves. But he of a truth is infinitely exalted above the mention of all his creatures. The words used to describe the divine being, that we use to describe the divine being, we are told, are only adequate to those with the same likeness and nature of themselves that are attempts to describe exaltedness of the divine being are themselves generated from within our own minds. I often think of if I'm trying to say, describe, say the brilliance of an Einstein or of a Newton. If I'm trying to describe the brilliance of a mind like Einstein or Newton, I can't even, when it comes to a human being, do so, because I cannot describe the limits of their conceptual or mathematical knowledge without being them. I can't know what it's like to be a Nobel Prize winner in physics and what it actually takes to have that much insight unless I've done it. Again from Baha'u'llah. 
to whatever heights the mind of the most exalted of men may soar, however great the depths which the detached and understanding heart can penetrate, such mind and heart can never transcend that which is the creature of their own conceptions and the product of their own thoughts. To pause for a moment. So no matter how high the minds of people can soar, however deep the most detached and understanding heart can actually penetrate, it cannot transcend the creature of their own conceptions, a product of our own thoughts. The quote then continues, The meditations of the profoundest thinker, the devotions of the holiest of saints, the highest expressions of praise from either human pen or tongue, are but a reflection of that which hath been created within themselves, through the revelation of the Lord their God. Whoever pondereth this truth in his heart will readily admit that there are certain limits which no human being can possibly transgress. The meditations of the profoundest thinker, the highest expressions of tongue or pen, of praise of the divine being, it states clearly here, are a reflection of that which have been created within themselves. That when we actually are seeking and striving and pushing to actually express the beauty of God or praise Him to the utmost, it is actually only a reflection of what we are. So the following quote is from the Svetasvatara Upanishad. As gold covered by earth shines bright after it has been purified. So also the yogi, realizing the truth of Atman, becomes one with the non-dual Atman, attains the goal and is free from grief. And when the yogi beholds the real nature of Brahman through the knowledge of the self, radiant as a lamp, then, having known the unborn and immutable Lord, who is untouched by ignorance and its effects. He is freed from all fetters. So the, this Upanishad here uses the example of gold when covered by earth. That after it has been purified, it then shines out. But this shining, as we saw right from the beginning, I believe in the Kata Upanishad, is a secondary shining. Brahman shines and all other things shine from him. This is a very, very familiar concept within the West. It's called the image of God, right? That we ourselves are as a mirror that reflects the divine light of the sun. That it is when we are purified like this gold or polished like a mirror, that the image of the divine being can shine through us that we see within ourselves the image of God. So even from a Jewish conception at the very beginning of the Torah, if we see ourselves as created in the image of God and were to actually polish it through worship and prayer, through service and through seeking, that as that becomes polished, what are we actually going to see? We're going to see the image of God. Our Atman is Brahman. Next follows Kutsayana's hymn of praise. So this is a hymn of praise. Thou art Brahma, and thou art Vishnu. Thou art Rudra, thou Prajapati. Thou art Agni, Varuna, Vayu. Thou art Indra, thou the moon. For reference, these are the gods of the Vedic pantheon. These are all divine beings in the Vedas, some of the most ancient scriptures of our world. And then continues, thou art Anna, the food or the eater. Thou art Yama. Thou art the earth, 
Thou art all. Thou art the imperishable. In thee all things exist in many forms, whether for their natural or for their own higher ends. Lord of the universe, glory to thee. Thou art the self of all. Thou art the maker of all, the enjoyer of all. Thou art all life and the Lord of all pleasure and joy. Glory be to thee, the tranquil, the deeply hidden, the incomprehensible, the immeasurable, without beginning and without end. Just at the beginning of this quote, all the divine beings that we see put forth within the Vedas, and in stories actually within the Upanishads, are said, seem to be said to be just manifestations of that one ultimate reality. That while it is the self of all, that being Brahman is the self of all, it actually says here, thou art the maker of all, the joy of all, the goal of all things. And that this being Brahman is incomprehensible, immeasurable, without beginning or end. So we have in here really a conception of divinity that sounds extremely Western, an all-knowing, all-powerful, ground of all being for all things, the source of all good that can manifest itself in many forms. The quote continues, In the beginning, darkness alone was this. It was in the highest, and moved by the highest, it becomes uneven. Thus it becomes obscurity, and this obscurity being moved becomes uneven. Thus it becomes goodness, then this goodness being moved, the essence flowed forth. This is that part or state of self which is entirely intelligent, reflected in man, as the sun is in different vessels of water, knowing the body, attested by his conceiving, willing, and believing. It is prajapati, common to all. Prajapati being that ultimate personhood in creation was in the beginning and there was darkness and then things were separated. And if you really read this, you're going to hear Genesis actually expressed. And then this light comes forward and that this light from this lightness and good, the essence comes forth. And out of that, this divine wisdom itself which is reflected in man, like sun in vessels of water. So we see that um, Brahman is the self of all, in the sense that it is like the sun shining in different vessels of water, or reflecting in gold. And that the shining of Brahman comes first, and it is the radiance of all things. And in this quote from the Maitrayani Upanishad, while Brahman is the self of all, he is also the creator of all, the, in, the immeasurable, the unknowable, the inconceivable. We now move to a couple of texts um, that show a different aspect of the Atman Brahman equation. The first is again from the Kata Upanishad, one of the chief principal Upanishads. There actually are about, I think, about 108 or 118 Upanishads, um, even more. But there are those which are extremely fundamental, which are the principal Upanishads, uh, that all Hindus would generally recognize as actually being canonical or, or of scriptural authority. And that's where all these are derived from. So this is from the Kata Upanishad. Beyond the senses are the objects. Beyond the objects is the mind. Beyond the mind, the intellect. Beyond the intellect, the great Atman. Beyond the great Atman, the unmanifest. Beyond the unmanifest, the Purusha. Beyond the Purusha, there is nothing. This is the end, the supreme goal. That self hidden in all beings does not shine forth, but it is seen by subtle seers through their one, pointed and subtle intellects. 
So we here have a tier, a structure of reality, where yes, there is actually the body, the mind, the intellect, and then we come to this great Atman. But beyond that great Atman, we have the unmanifest and the Purusha, which is the divine personality, if you will, the supreme personality of Godhead that we see reflected within the Bhagavad Gita. This is actually what Krishna states he is. He is supposed to be Vishnu, embodied in the person of Krishna. But Vishnu himself, that divine being we saw in one of the texts above, is actually itself just a manifestation of Brahman, the Purusha, the Supreme One. This is really the concept that we find within the Baha'i writings of the manifestation of God, or the Logos, or the will of God. That that one divine being, which is the intermediary between God and men, is then manifested and reflected in the souls or the Atmans of the individual people of our planet. And this being, uh, often referred to as Lahut, if you will, the, the manifestation of God, or the Logos of the New Testament, is itself the divine being that communicates to humankind, and of which we are an image. Now the instruction about Brahman with regard to the individual self. This is how the text begins. The mind, as it were, goes to Brahman. The seeker, by means of the mind, communes with it intimately again and again. This should be the volition of his mind. That Brahman is called Tadvana, the adorable of all. It should be worshipped by the name of Tadvana. All creatures desire him who worships Brahman thus. Here in the Kenu Upanishad, we're being given instruction explicitly about Brahman with regard to the individual self. That's how the quote begins. That the seeker, as it were, stretches his mind forth to reach Brahman so that he can commune with Brahman, chiefly through meditation and prayer. That this should be the volition of a human psyche, and that that being is the adorable of all beings, and that we should strive to reach for it. The next is from the Tatriya Upanishad. Let him contemplate Brahman as the support, and he will be supported. Let him contemplate Brahman as greatness, and he will become great. Let him contemplate Brahman as the mind, and he will be endowed with mind. Um, we're told that when we contemplate Brahman, the ultimate reality, as the support or greatness, or I would add as beauty or the all-knowing, that that is actually what we become. We see this actually in the writings of the Baha'i Faith, this first from Baha'u'llah. All comparisons and likenesses fail to do justice to the tree of thy revelation, and every way is barred to the comprehension of the manifestation of thyself and the day spring of thy beauty. The tree uh, of the revelation is the manifestation of God. The one point, the primal point, that being which we find expressed within our world as Krishna, as the Buddha, as Baha'u'llah. The tree of revelation, the manifestation of his own self, is portrayed as oneness, that ultimate oneness in reality, the intermediary between the unknowable essence, Hahut, and humanity. That one manifestation of God, the singular manifestation of God that we saw in the person of Jesus Christ, the Word becoming flesh, um, known as Lahut, comes into our world in different expressions. From a Baha'i perspective, and this is often within the realm of Jabarut, the realm of power, when these divine beings, if you will, like different reflections or different rays of that one eternal sun, shine throughout our world. Baha'u'llah continues, Far, far from thy glory be what mortal man can affirm of thee, or attribute unto thee, 
or the praise with which he can glorify thee. Whatever duty thou hast prescribed unto thy servants of extolling to the utmost thy majesty and glory is but a token of thy grace unto them, that they may be enabled to ascend unto the station conferred upon their own inmost being, the station of the knowledge of their own selves. This is actually from the first quotation from Gleanings of the Writings of Baha'u'llah. It is the first selection selected by Shoghi Effendi. And it goes through a series of tears of how humankind seeks to actually praise God. But that praise can only really be actually attributable unto those beings that we see in our world, the manifestations of God. But even less than that, <laughs> that these are only an expression of the light that we see in our own selves. And the quote finishes with this, that whatever duty God has prescribed unto his servants of extolling to the utmost God's majesty is only that humankind can ascend to the station conferred upon their own inmost being. And that station is the knowledge of our own selves. So if we think about prayer and meditation, we're in a state where we're reaching our hearts and reaching our minds to try to understand the divine being. And in a sense, as we're doing this, we're actually just seeing more and more of the image or reflection of that sun in many vessels of water within our own selves. We begin to actually more deeply understand what the divine being is through our prayer, our meditation, our service, our exploration of the arts and sciences, and in such as we're ascending to the station conferred upon our own inmost being, we come to know ourselves. And here Baha'u'llah is telling us this was actually the purpose of worship, that this is what, as we saw at the very beginning, the manifestations are sent in this world to do. They're sent here to enable us to become what we're truly meant to be. That in a sense, as we're seeking to pray to our Brahman, our ultimate reality, as we're stretching our hearts and minds to actually push further and further our understanding of that divine being, it's actually ourselves that we're coming to understand. The meditations of the profoundness of thinkers, the devotions of the holiest of saints, are but a reflection of their own selves. This concept uh, is very beautifully expressed by the Guardian in the following quote. The more we search for ourselves, the less likely we are to find ourselves. And the more we search for God and to serve our fellow men, the more profoundly will we become acquainted with ourselves and the more inwardly assured. This is one of the great spiritual laws of life. The Upanishad seems to be telling us that our Atman is Brahman. I think it more aptly would be stated that our Brahman is our Atman. That how we define, understand, and express ultimate reality is actually in and of itself a vision of the reflection of God within us, the image of God in whom we were created. And the guardian here is telling us that we, we shouldn't be seeking ourselves. We're not supposed to be searching for who we truly are, because the more we search, the less likely we're to find it. And he says, the more we search for God and serve our fellow man, the more profoundly we become acquainted with ourselves. Because if we truly understand that our reality is the image of God, that of love, of justice, of compassion, that mystic union with reality, that the more we begin to follow that path and express it in works of charitable acts, of service to humankind, we come to see what we really are. It's like, if we look to, to what we are, uh, I am 
an aspiring musician, <laughs> right? If I look to what I am um, at the beginning of that path, I'm going to see someone who cannot play music. Necessarily, that's the stage I'm at. I actually have to be looking far beyond what I am in order to actually make that a reality. It's actually my belief in my own potential, in my own capacity, an individual that I am not far off on a horizon that enables me to master any skill whatsoever. When it comes to the Atman Brahman challenge, it's trying to express the fact that we have to realize that what we really are is a reflection of the divine. Yes, we might be that secondary light, that reflection, but that the more we seek to commune with God, the more we seek to serve our fellow men and stretch our understanding of what divinity actually implies, the more we're going to see, if you will, the reality of what we can truly be and the more we become. People often see within Hinduism as if there's either like a polytheistic world, like there's a whole bunch of different gods, or on the other side as if really there's no god god, as if something above and beyond us, it's simply my Atman soul is that Brahman, right? That ultimate reality. So we have two of these actual like fundamental confusions around Hinduism, which I believe if one's willing to actually look at the actual text, be it the Upanishads, be it the Vedas, the Puranas, or the Bhagavad Gita, we find that is actually not what is being expressed in Hindu texts. The God of Hinduism itself is one ineffable ultimate reality. It's simply that we ourselves, our true nature, is a reflection of the attributes of that divine being, an image in a mirror. Right? So I think it's important to see this even in the context of Ottoman Brahman. So I have one final quote to look at. Um, this quote actually is from the Kena Upanishad. Um, I think just a very, obviously they're all scripture, but just a truly, truly pivotal uh, Upanishad for understanding the Ottoman Brahman issue as well as the conception of ultimate reality in Hinduism period. So it begins. Brahman, according to the story, obtained a victory for the gods. And by that victory of Brahman, the gods became elated. They said to themselves, Verily this victory is ours. Verily this glory is ours only. Brahman, to be sure, understood it all and appeared before them. But they did not know who that adorable spirit was. This is the first two verses of this chapter of the Kaning Upanishad. And immediately we see a picture where Brahman, ultimate reality, has obtained a victory for the gods, but they actually think that it's theirs. They actually believe they have attained the victory, but Brahman is aware of all this, and he appears to them, but they don't know what he is. Uh, what's so important about the quote initially is that even the gods of the Vedas the chief gods of Hinduism, themselves are unaware of the reality of Brahman. Um, the, the quote actually continues. They said to Agni, fire, or the god of fire, O Agni, find out who this great spirit is. Yes, he said, and hastened to it. Brahman asked him, Who are you? He replied, I am known as Agni. I am also called Jataveda. Brahman said, What power is in you, who are so well known? Fire, or the god Agni, replied, I can burn all, whatever there is on earth. Brahman put a straw before him and said, Burn this. He rushed toward it with all his ardor, but could not burn it. Then he returned from the spirit and said to the gods, I could not find out who this spirit is. Then they said to Vayu, the god of air, O Vayu, find out who this great spirit is. Yes, he said, and hastened to it. Brahman asked him, Who are you? He replied, I am known as Vayu. I am also called Matarisva. Brahman said, What power is in you, who are so well known? Vayu replied, 
I can carry off all whatever there is on earth. Brahman put a straw before him and said, carry this. He rushed toward it with all his ardor, but could not move it. Then he returned from the spirit and said to the gods, I could not find out who this spirit is. Then the gods said to Indra, O Magavan, find out who this great spirit is. Yes, he said, and hastened to it, but the spirit disappeared from him. Then Indra beheld in that very region of the sky a woman, highly adorned. She was Uma, the daughter of the Himalayas. He approached her and said, Who is this great spirit? She replied, It is indeed Brahman. Through the victory of Brahman alone have you attained glory. After that, Indra understood that it was Brahman. Since they approached very near Brahman and were the first to know that it was Brahman, these devas, namely Agni, Vayu, and Indra, excelled the other gods. Since Indra approached Brahman nearest, and since he was the first to know that it was Brahman, Indra excelled the other gods. This quote uh, from the Kenna Upanishad uh, is so perfect because it actually shows Brahman as a figure, Brahman as a personality. Brahman as a communicating entity to the other divine beings. Oftentimes Hinduism uh, is seen as, as I said, polytheistic on one hand, uh, which it is not. All the gods of the Vedas, all the gods of the, the Hindu pantheon really are lesser beings within a divine hierarchy. So much so that they don't even know uh, Brahman himself and that their actual ascendancy is in to the degree to which they have drawn near unto Brahman or come to know Brahman. Um, this also is very important for the Atman-Brahman issue because we see once again that Brahman is an individual entity, itself a divine ultimate reality that we are subservient unto but can reflect his image. So um, not only is it related to polytheism, and Atman Brahman, but we also see once again, because Hinduism is often portrayed as if Brahman is an impersonal entity, sort of like a divine abstract, like a law of nature. But here we see that Brahman himself actually can appear and manifest unto his realm of creation. This is the divine logos. This is the Lahut that we see within the Baha'i scriptures. And I would suggest even Uma, the female being that actually appears here, is the image of the maid of heaven.